brothers and sisters, we are going to look at uh, two different texts for our message this morning. We are going to look first at Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 to 28. Now, this is still in sort of the section of the book of Hebrews that we looked at last week, where uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking a uh, big picture about the theme of a great high priest and that great high priest being Jesus our Lord. And, and this is an important theme, remembering especially that, that the author of Hebrews, whomever that might have been, was speaking primarily to Jewish people, but also remembering that because of Jesus, and because of also the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people like Paul and other apostles, all kinds of Gentiles such as ourselves were brought into the family of God and became, as it were, spiritual descendants of Abraham. And so these words about the great high priest Jesus apply to us just as much as they would to any of those who would have been uh, the original hearers of the book of Hebrews. So, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 to 28. Now, there, there have been many of those priests, that is, the high priests in the temple in Jerusalem, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Just to remind you that that little phrase at the end, perfect, has been made perfect forever, that is not, as we talked about last week, that is not saying that Jesus was sinful and imperfect in that way and then became perfect and not sinful. No, no, no. This is referring to that perfection of completeness and experience and so on, right? That Jesus, as we remember, learned obedience. He was, not that he was disobedient before, but the, the ante, the, the level of obedience was constantly increasing in his life. He was asked to do these things, and then he was asked to do these things, and these things, and finally to give up his very life. And so his obedience, his perfection, it was made perfect in the sense that it was expanded to its fullness and completeness such that he would give even his own life in obedience to the Father. It's a little bit like what C.S. Lewis says. He says, if you are faithful in some small thing, I'm paraphrasing, I'm afraid, uh, if you are faithful in some small thing, then often your reward is to be given a bigger thing to be faithful in, right? If you are faithful in that little still small voice saying, hey, go and talk to Tony after the service and see how he's doing. Great, good, you've been faithful in that, that's wonderful. Then often God is going to ask you to do something bigger, like talk to Barb. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> I'm sorry, Barb. <laughs> good, good point. <laughs> right? No, God... God rewards the faithfulness that we give with the opportunity to be even more faithful, right? A and that is a beautiful thing. And that's what it's talking about when Jesus is made perfect. 
It is that his, his obedience, his faithfulness has been filled up by doing all of the good things that God has called him to do. All right, moving on to our second passage. Our second passage is from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. David, if you could put up that uh, first passage, Hebrews 7 again, that would be really great. There's a couple of verses, especially verse 25 and 26, that we need to look at uh, particularly. You see, these two stories, if we combine them, we can see the contrasting characters in this story that we have in the Gospel of Mark. See, it is important to remember the distance between Jesus and Bartimaeus on some levels. It is also important, see, the universe is made of objects that orbit other objects in a lot of ways, right? We on earth, we orbit the sun. The moon orbits us. The sun orbits around the center of the galaxy, right? Our galaxy is flying away from the center of the universe, but it is also orbiting around, right? It is important to remember this because, you see, in our world, we have a tendency to think that we orbit, you and I, individually, we orbit around ourselves. We may not say this, but we act like it. We've been reading a, a book as, as a family in our devotions called Christianity's Surprise. And one of the things it talks about is this idea that uh, we have in the Western world especially that we are autonomous individuals. Meaning that we, uh, we stand all on our own and our will, my will, my will is sovereign and I am alone. I decide who I am. I decide what I will value. I decide who I will have relationship with. I decide what terms there will be in those relationships. I design my destiny and define myself. I am the autonomous individual. And I am, according to much of what we feel and see and hear in this Western world, I am my own son. I revolve around myself. But that is far from the reality as it is described in the scriptures. 
It, it's not even logical if you think in terms of, of science, of actual, factual, practical, everyday reality. We've talked about this before, but I'll remind us again. How many of you actually were able to determine that you would indeed wake up today? Really, truly. I mean, you set an alarm, perhaps, right? You, you laid the groundwork for waking up today, but really you had no choice in the matter. You could have died in the night. You would have had nothing that you could maybe do about that. If God decided to suck all the air off of planet Earth, you would have been dead. If God decided, and this is, this is where we get into slightly more theological terms, if God decided to stop sustaining you, you would stop to exist, stop existing. Right? You actually and I have very little choice about a great deal of things. And certainly we are not our own son. Now Bartimaeus, he understands this. He may be living in a world of darkness caused by blindness, but his perspective of his relationship to God in Jesus Christ is better than Ours often is. You see, Bartimaeus, one of the characters in our story, uh, we're going to talk about him before we talk about Jesus, our great high priest, I guess. Uh, Bartimaeus is a blind person. And, and in our society, we know that there is nothing lesser about a person who is blind or a person who is crippled or a person who has other um, ability deficits or anything like that. There's nothing lesser about people like that. However, in Jesus' day, in his society, it was understood that people who were blind or crippled or otherwise disabled, they were probably being punished either for their own sin or for the sin of their parents or some other family member. And so Bartimaeus was not only blind, as in he couldn't work for a living, they didn't have braille, he didn't, you know, have, well, maybe he did have a cane or whatever, but they did not have the same sort of structures to help people get along. Bartimaeus was not only incapable of taking care of himself in that society, but also he was seen as kind of cast out, unclean from society because he was being punished for his or his parents' sin. And so he knew in his society that he was, as it were, a lowly bacteria. He was already on the fringes of society. Not only was it seen to be true that people who were disabled were considered to be being punished for their sins or the sins of their parents, but also being poor was seen as a punishment for sin. And so for Bartimaeus, who is a beggar at the gates of Jericho, he is his his disconnection, his lowly status in society is exasper exacerbated by the reality that not only is he blind, but he's poor. And so he is twice punished by God for the sins that he has, or his parents did. And then, of course, you contrast that with Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, and you read in seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 25 and 26, about how Jesus is the high priest. And you hear, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for him. So Jesus, Jesus always lives. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy and blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. 
Now, if you ignore the part about how that high priest meets our need, and if you ignore the part about how people can be saved by coming completely by coming to God through him, you see that Jesus, his status is like nut bar high compared to the lowly Bartimaeus. Right? If we can imagine, right, that our prime minister comes to Athens, right? Well, I mean, in our society, we are taught very strongly not to um, look up to people who are in the kind of authority that the prime minister is in the same way that they would have looked at a king or a ruler in Jesus' day. But nonetheless, and even if we disagree with his politics, we would, I imagine, probably hold our prime minister in some respect, and it would be somewhat a little bit awe-inspiring to meet him in person. But think about how much more that would properly be if you thought of yourself as Fred the Bacteria and you were confronted with the Son of God himself. Right? This is the dynamic of the relationship between Bartimaeus and Jesus. Bartimaeus is nothing in the world's eyes, and probably in his own eyes too. And Jesus is more than everything. And yet, Bartimaeus cries out, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And Jesus, Jesus does not reject him. Even the crowd around Jesus knows that properly speaking, Jesus probably should reject Bartimaeus. Don't. Don't bother the teacher. You're the lowest of the low. You're just shh. Right? But Jesus doesn't do that. He says, call him. Right? He is a high priest, as Hebrews 7, 26 says. He is a high priest who truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens, and therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. He's always there to intercede. So he does, he does. He intercedes for Bartimaeus. He prays and he's healed. And, and he says, go, your faith has made you well. And Bartimaeus, who maybe felt that his orbit was as far as Pluto is from the sun, his orbit is changed. So that now he revolves closely around the sun, Jesus. Right? In fact, Jesus says to him, go, go. Your faith has made you well. And what does he do? Instead of going, he follows Jesus. That's what we hear. He follows Jesus. Right? He walks around with him. He received his sight, verse 52 of Mark chapter 10. Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. His orbit has been altered. Now, for you and I, the question becomes, what is your orbit? And not just in general, but particularly today, tomorrow, five minutes from now, five minutes ago. Are you revolving around yourself? 
Do you feel as far away from God as Pluto is from the sun? Or are you pretending that you are your own sun? In either case, we need to give our head and our hearts a shake. And remember that without Jesus' high priestness, we are at least as far from God as Pluto is from the sun. And we need to give our heads a shake and remember that regardless of our relationship with Jesus in terms of high priestness, we are not our own sun to revolve around. We are Fred the bacteria compared to our God. And yet, and yet, because Jesus has become one of us, because Jesus has become the great high priest, because of his sacrifice and his perfect obedience, because of that, we are no longer Fred the Bacteria and Izzy. We are now brother and sister with Christ. We are now worshiper and God. We are now sons and daughters around our great Lord and Father. Closer in orbit than any other relationship could be. If we have a life that recognizes, like Bartimaeus did, our need for a new orbit, then we can live in a way <laughs> that is so much freer, so much better than the life of the autonomous individual. Brothers and sisters, We, because of Jesus, are in the right orbit. Now, of course, we need to get rid of the debris, the space debris that is standing in the way of us having that smooth and good relationship with God. So, the question for us is to remember that we are in orbit around Jesus and not ourselves, but also to ask ourselves, what's getting in the way of that smooth working of that relationship? What stands in the way between Jesus and I? Is it entertainment that stands in my way? Is it uh, pride I'm not willing to give up myself to him? Is it money, power, family? Do we value our family more than we value Jesus? There are in the universe things called uh, binary star systems. They're interesting because they have two stars and they revolve around each other. And sometimes scientists think those star systems can even have planets that revolve in a complicated dance around the two stars. And you can imagine that if those planets had moons further, how complicated that dance would be. Scientists also think that maybe the Oort cloud, which is a cloud of, of, of um, or the Kuiper belt in our solar system, that both of those things might actually have been 
planets at one time, but they smashed into something and they have turned into just debris fields of, of asteroids and, and whatever they're called. I forget what they're called. But anyways, they're, they're just rubble, basically. It's complicated to try and live your life revolving around multiple different things. And God says through the scriptures that it's not even really possible for human beings to do that. No one, Jesus says, will serve two masters. You will either serve the one and neglect the other or vice versa. So what are the things in your life that are trying to take your orbit away from God. I want to live single-mindedly, single-heartedly, fully and completely for God. But I know that there's lots of things out there competing for my heart and for my mind. Let's take a few moments to think of those things that compete for your heart and give them to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that we were designed to live in perfect relationship with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, around whom we orb orbit as our center, the meaning in our lives, and the light in which we live and move and have our being. And yet, Lord, we know just like Bartimaeus, that without Jesus in our lives, we feel and are in some ways so distant from you. And we know too, O oh God, that there are many, many things that compete to pull us away from you as if their gravity were stronger than yours. Lord, please hear us and help us with your Holy Spirit to examine ourselves and see the things which claim us apart from you, the things which pull us aside, the things which hamper our smooth orbit around you. Lord, open our hearts to see those things in our lives. Lord, help us now to release those things to you. Help us to know what we ought to do about those things. Whether we need to cut back on them or eliminate them completely from our lives. Help us to do so. Help us most of all to lay them at your feet and submit to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember um, early on in my, um, in my university days, uh, there were friends of mine who had made commitments 
uh, to Jesus and who decided that as part of their commitment, they needed to get rid of all secular music in their lives. They needed to focus on music that explicitly honored God. A and this was, uh, there were some problems with that sometimes in some ways, but on the other hand, the heart of what they were doing was noble and good. They saw that this music that they loved, this music that was secular, again, problem, but anyways, was getting in the way of their orbit with God. And so they got rid of it. Gwyneth's parents did that at some point or another. They had a beautiful, pristine copy of the Beatles' White Album, and they smashed it to bits in their commitment to God. And while it's a little bit heartbreaking that that album is gone, their commitment was good. So, two questions for you. What is God asking you to get rid of or to cut back on? Three questions. And what are you going to do about it? And who are you going to be accountable to? for it. Okay? Thankfully, God doesn't call us very often to, <laughs> it wouldn't be possible anyways, to eliminate all of the things that compete at once. Sometimes he does, though. But what is God calling you to get rid of? Maybe, maybe it's your pride. Maybe, maybe you really need help, but you're too prideful to ask for it or to receive it. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it is your, 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 your privacy, right? Maybe you value your own privacy too much and you need to get rid of it on some level. Or, or maybe it is something like music or entertainment, books. Maybe it is something like hobbies. Maybe you need to get rid of some level of work in your life. Maybe you're too focused and orbiting around work too much. Maybe, maybe you need to limit or refocus your relationships with your children or your wife or your husband. Or your grandkids. What is it that you need to set aside or limit and put in its proper place? And how are you going to do it? And who are you going to be accountable to with it? You don't need to answer those things out loud right now. But if you can, you should talk about it with whomever God is poking at you to be your accountability person. Talk about it with your wife, your husband. Talk about it with your kids, your grandkids. Talk about it with your pastor. Talk about it with your elder. Talk about it with your deacon. Talk about it with your cousin once removed on your mother's, grandmother's side. Whatever. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Figure it out and do something. I'm going to watch one hour of TV less a week because I spend too much time on it, for example. I'm going to <coughs> read less pulpy science fiction books and more theological books. I'm going to work five hours a week less than I usually do. I'm going to pray <coughs> 15 minutes a day more than I do now. Brothers and sisters, our song of response at this time, let us Sing 